The only real, the place with access problems, I would say, the worst is the esplanade of the mosques uh, and getting inside the mosques, which is, if you're not a Muslim, can can be close to impossible. But how, how do they know that I'm not a Muslim? Well, can you recite a line of the Quran for me? No. Well, that's one way they can guess you're not a Muslim. Well, maybe, maybe I tell them, well, in Germany, we, we are liberal Muslims and we recite the German Quran. Yeah, and then German they version. would probably say to you, go recite your liberal German Quran somewhere else. <laughs> All right, young and naive, we moved on. We're still in Israel, but uh, where are we here? We're in Jerusalem. We're in the neighborhood of Abu Tor, which we can see around us. And it's um, just kind of uh, a neighborhood that unusually for Jerusalem, it represents in a way the whole city because you have here Arabs and Jews, you have very wealthy people, you have a lot of UN people even, you have very poor people. So it's a strange neighborhood, but it's sort of a microcosm at what, the same time. What, what is the UN doing here? Well, a lot of people would tell you they're doing nothing here. <laughs> What would you tell them? Yeah, no, I think um, the UN has uh, probably the number one role here in terms of all of the international organizations that are located here. Uh, there's UNICEF, there's the UN Development Organization, there's UNRWA, and basically the headquarters for the UN is right up the street over there. It's called Government House, and it's the old seat of the British mandatory governor. Oh, yeah. I learned in previous episodes that uh, the British were here like in the early 20th century or something. Yeah, um, they were. Um, almost everyone has been here at one point or another, so it's not unique. But uh, when the British uh, won the First World War, they won Palestine, the territory of Palestine. Mm -hmm. In 1917, and they were here until 1948, mm -hmm. but they had a much bigger effect on what we know of modern Jerusalem today than the relatively small period of time that they were here. Well, tell us about it. So there are historic buildings here, like the King David Hotel or like a government house that were built basically as the face of Britain, you know, in the Middle East. This is mm. still an imperial time mm. for the United Kingdom. Um, and the train, the Jerusalem train, the, the old train station that's a five minute walk from here was built by the British oh. or improved significantly by the British. Uh, there are bars that exist in Jerusalem that were very popular among British officers. And uh, there's quite a bit of an effect. So how, how's, how's Jerusalem doing today? Is it like, uh, is it still a special city? I think it's a very special city. I think it's... You, it's hard to use the word unique and be serious about it, but I think Jerusalem might be a unique city. Why? First of all, because everyone has fought about it so hard. People have been fighting over Jerusalem for 3,000 years, and it's still unresolved. What people? Um, so I can't give you a full list, unfortunately, but, you know, so <laughs> the many. Israelites, the Mamluks, um, I'm trying to think of more ancient peoples, right? Uh, Even the Romans? Yeah, of really? course. Oh. Yeah, the Romans, there's a, an exile. The Babylonians, you name it. The Germans were here, the British were here. Oh. Uh, everyone has fought over... I, I once saw a statistic of how many, I think over 50 battles have been held just for Jerusalem. Why is Jerusalem so so important? For all those... For, 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 all for thousands of years. Well... Initially, probably, you know, it's called David's city, right? So um, history has it that this city was established by King David. Who was that? King David is one of the kings of Judea, kings of the Jewish people, a biblical figure and a historic figure, famous for Jerusalem and uh, famous for even, you know, lusting after Bathsheba next to the walls. It's a place you can go see next to the walls of the old city. Um, but this was an important military height because Jerusalem is almost one kilometer elevated. So if you look that way, you can see basically any, you know, pirates invading you from the Dead Sea. Oh. Uh, you're protected by the Judean hills on the other side. So just geographically, it was a crucial location. Also, you have these nice, cool breezes here compared to the difficulties of desert life. Mm -hmm. 
and there are watery springs here. And so you have to take into account that we're in a desert. Right. So Jerusalem offered many advantages. And since then, it's basically become a holy city or a very desirable, a jewel in the crown for many, many, many people. To say that uh, uh, for many empires and countries to say that they possess Jerusalem has been a real point of pride. So you say holy city, uh, does it have anything to do with, anything to do with religion? It has, um, probably unfortunately, it has a lot to do with religion. Mm. Uh, it's the third most holy city for Muslims. Specifically, the Dome of the Rock is the third most holy site after Mecca and Medina. For Jews, it's the number one holy site. For Christians, evidently, because of Jesus' the story in Jerusalem, it's uh, one of the most holy sites. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is very holy for Christians, especially Catholics. The Western Wall, which is the Western retaining wall of the old temple before the Jewish exile, is in all of this, and the Rome of the Rock, all of these are within a few meters of one another in the old city of Jerusalem. And they're kind of, at the same time, the beating heart of this city, and also the reason for so many uh, battles and so much bloodshed. When was the last battle for Jerusalem? Well, the last real battle over Jerusalem, I guess, was in 1967, not so long ago. Oh. Uh, the last time Jerusalem was under siege was 1948, which for the Arab world is called the War of 48. For Israelis, it's the War of Independence. And Jerusalem was uh, enclosed by the Arab Legion for a while. Um, so there was a siege and there was no food and water. But in 1967, Jerusalem was uh, attacked by the Jordanian army, I think. And uh, there were real battles, major, major battles, not far from here, in fact, in the city of Jerusalem itself. So uh, what's the status now? Like who, is there a religion that controls the city now? Like. So the city is not controlled by any religious authority, okay. except for little specific parts of it. So your question is actually a good question. Oh. Uh, Jerusalem is run by City Hall. There's a mayor of Jerusalem, and there are very famous poems, especially by the great poet of Jerusalem, Yehuda Michai, wrote a poem I recommend that you see called Mayor of Jerusalem, and he talks about how it's an impossible city to rule because you're always building the stones up and then someone comes and tears the stones down. But it's run by City Hall. Um, so it's like it's, it's run by a secular? Uh, yeah, completely. It's run. It's like any other city anywhere in the world. There's a mayor of Jerusalem. Uh, he's a guy, and he's called Nir Barkat, and he's the head of this of the city government. But the holy sites in Jerusalem, the Christian, the Muslim, and the Jewish holy sites, are in the hands of religious authorities. Each one their own authority. So, for example, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is fought over by at least four churches. There have sometimes been fistfights in the church between different monks. There's a lot of tension among Jews by how the Western Wall is run because it's run by really, really, really extremist, uh, ultra-Orthodox um, authorities that don't represent most of the Jews of Israel. So there's a lot of tension, but the holy sites are kind of like Expropriated zones. Huh. Yeah. We, we went to the, the, the to the Western Wall and we saw like it, it's segregated. Like the the women have their special corner, and the the men can only go into the prayer hall. That's really uh, yeah, and that's not actually entirely legal. That that's true what you saw, but it's not entirely legal. And the way that this religious authority gets away with doing that, and in particular with leaving, you probably notice women have such a tiny area yeah. compared to men. Yeah but we're not actually less in number than men. Right. <laughs> so they declared the entire site a synagogue, mm. which was a little trick under the law. And then if it's a synagogue, you can say, this is our religious hall and we can do with it what we want. We separate women from men, we do whatever. But it's in my mind, it's really a very problematic thing because I think Israeli civil law should be relevant in front of the Western Wall like it is anywhere else. Right. And uh, I don't think it's a synagogue. I think it's a historical place that absolutely belongs to, you know, 
any Jew who wants to have access to it and also should belong to all of humanity as a historic site. So what you saw is a quirk in how religious law can be imposed in a way that at least I think is very inappropriate. Has it been like this for, since 67? No, not at all. The religious authorities have gotten more and more extreme. And in a political trade-off, every time there's a new government, basically, uh, the governments relinquish more of their control over the holy sites. So, okay, you guys take care of it. And then they hope that the religious parties or religious authorities won't bother them in other things that they don't want to be part of. Oh. So, for example, you know, this current government that we have in Israel is a very right-wing government. There are no religious parties that are part of this government. And so there's always this political kind of horse race between what they get. But um, when the Western Wall was first opened with access given to the Jews of Jerusalem in 1967, it was just a wall. There was no mini wall in front of it. There were no separations. It's simply the physical structure, which itself is incredibly moving. You know, it's a 3,000 year old wall yeah. and it's a place people have prayed about and towards for 3,000 years. Um, and now it's kind of become more and more uh, sort of the belonging of a little sect that are the ones who are running it. Can you, can you briefly explain why the Western Wall is so important to the Jews? Yes, because... Or, or to those Jews? I think, I think I would say it's important to most Jews in the world, not just Israeli Jews, and, and important not only to Jews. Um, in ancient Jerusalem, there was a temple on this platform where the two mosques are now, the Mosque of Omar and the Dome of the Rock which is the beautiful golden yeah. mosque we all know, right. So there was a temple there. You can see a beautiful model of this temple in the Israel Museum, by the way, a recreation of what that was like. And um, that was destroyed when the Jews were exiled, the Roman exile. 2,000 years ago? Uh, yes, ah. I think. I'm not a historian. That's what I they, hope I'll be that, forgiven. That's what they tell us. Yes, okay, let's go with that. Oh. <laughs> so... The temple was destroyed. Oh. And for Jews, any remnant of that temple, and especially the most holy place, it's called the Holy of Holies, in that temple is sort of the closest physical access that any Jew can have, you know, to uh, a godlike presence on this earth. And the only thing that's left. They imagine that. Well, I think they feel it. I think for, you know, in the same way that Christians come and kind of prostrate themselves in the in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on the grave of Christ, right? Those Christians who believe that Christ is buried there, for them it's as close as they can get, you know, to God or to godliness. For Jews, that's the Western Wall. And it's the only thing left from that period. It was not actually, the wall is not a wall of the temple. It's a retaining wall of this mount oh. upon which the mosques are now and before it was the temple. Uh. Can, can Muslims and Christians go to the wall? Yeah, anybody can go to the wall unless you're a woman dressed too immodestly for the religious authorities who run it. But oh, really? yeah, and there's sometimes real harassment against women there. I, I'm really making this point because there's a movement now that's really grown called Women of the Wall who are demanding the right to pray freely at the wall and to pray wherever they want. And so it's become a contentious issue among religious Jews, Orthodox religious Jews. And that's why I think it's worth mentioning. So can Jews go into the Dome of Rock? No, not really. Oh. <laughs> yeah, these are very tricky uh, questions. The temple, the, the two mosques and the whole esplanade of the mosques is run by the Waqf, that is the Muslim religious authority. And it's just the same as like, you know, I said to you, Israeli civil law should be ruling also at the Western Wall. Israeli civil law should be ruling also on the esplanade of the mosques, and therefore anybody should have access. But the fact of the matter is they don't. Uh, the WAC runs it very, very, um, I would say, sternly. There's access to non-Muslims sometimes for just one hour a day, and it's not every day of the week. Mm. And the claim on the part of the WAC, of the Muslim authorities, is that this is done as a protest against Israelis 
um, restrictions, the, those restrictions that Israelis put on Muslims, on, on Arabs mm -hmm. in this country, but it's become much, much more than that. And it's become de facto a place where uh, even tourists, anyone has access for very little time. And, and most of the time you won't have access inside the mosques. You'll just have access to the esplanade of the mosques. Uh, like, like we went to the Wailing Wall and then like after that we tried to go to the Dome of Rock and then soldiers or policemen were like, yeah, uh, not today. Uh, come back tomorrow morning. It, it's open from 7.30 till 11 or something. Yeah, see? And you'll be lucky if it's really open between 7.30 and 11. What, in my experience, what that normally means is that at some point between 7.30 and 11, you can get access, but you have to be lucky. And uh, it's very, very, it's a very complicated thing. And politicians, everyone, the mayor of Jerusalem almost doesn't have himself real control over the holy sites because they're such a, a delicate and complicated issue, each one of them, that it's considered a matter of national and often international importance. Uh, you know, the Pope came recently in May to Jerusalem, oh. and he was at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And for him, that's like being at home. That's for him. It belongs to the Catholic Church, and no one else really has much to say about it. Although, as I told you, there are many churches that fight over it. But a lot of people feel this bit of Jerusalem belongs to me, and people are willing to die for that. So, uh, do the Christians let Muslims and Jews in? Pretty much, yes. Anyone has access to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, right? The only real, the place with access problems, I would say, the worst is the esplanade of the mosques uh, and getting inside the mosques, which is, if you're not a Muslim, can, can be close to impossible. How, how do they know that I'm not a Muslim? Well, can you recite a line of the Quran for me? No. Well, that's one way they can guess you're not a Muslim. Well, maybe, maybe I tell them, well, in Germany, we, we are liberal Muslims and we recite the German Koran. Yeah, and then German they would probably say to you, go recite your liberal German Koran somewhere else. <laughs> that's my, my guess. But it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, it is kind of crazy. A, a lot about this city is kind of crazy. A lot of the reactions to this city are kind of crazy. And then what's really crazy is that there's a whole part of the city that's completely not crazy. Tell us about that. Well, you know, you have all the government bureaucrats who live here. You have a great university here. So you have all the professors and all the students. You have a great art academy. You have uh, every tourist in the world, as far as I can tell, wants at some point to come to Jerusalem. So you have all these hotels and all these people going around. You have... Uh, extremely wide-ranging cultural life um, and very, very active high-tech scene. Mm. So there's a great uh, cosmopolitan side of Jerusalem and varied side and real-life side, mm. uh, which is, I think, the level at which many, many Jerusalemites live their life. You know, good restaurants, nice bars, film festivals, whatever. And then there's this other Jerusalem that's maybe slightly at a distance from the real-life Jerusalem. Is, is, it, is that why it's called Old City? Is that the maybe. Old City? Well, the Old City is the ancient Jerusalem, the, the most ancient part, and it's, you know, surrounded by these walls. The walls, by the way, are not 3,000-year-old walls. It's around the Old City. Mm -hmm. Many people think so, but they're Ottoman-era walls. The Ottoman Empire mm -hmm. ruled here for uh, over 700 years, and um, so they fixed things up quite a bit. And the walls around the old city were mostly reconstructed at that time, or constructed. So, like, I heard, like, uh, somebody said, uh, he, he said, East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. What, what is that about? What is it like a separated city? Like, I mean, we, we, we're we from Berlin, East yeah. Berlin, West Berlin. Does that, is that wall too? No, no. there isn't. So, this is a, a really complicated question to answer, because Jerusalem is both a divided city and a non-divided city. Ooh. Yeah, there's no wall, but there used to be an international frontier between, not, for 19 years of Jerusalem's history, 3,000 years, for 19 years, Jerusalem was a divided city, and Jordan ruled East Jerusalem, the Arab parts of Jerusalem, between 1948 and 1967, and the new state of Israel ruled West Jerusalem between 1948 and 1967, but it's not as clean-cut as it 
I'm making it sound because many Arabs were ejected from where they lived in what we now consider Jewish West Jerusalem. Many Jews were ejected from where they lived, sometimes for millennia, in what we now consider Arab East Jerusalem. So East and West is a very real construct in the sense that Arabs by and large live in East Jerusalem, Jews by and large live in West Jerusalem. Right now we're in one of the few neighborhoods that's genuinely and truly a mixed neighborhood. There are not a lot of those. Um, but it's not as black and white as it sounds. And some people uh, live their lives in all parts of Jerusalem, and many people are afraid. Arabs are afraid to go to West Jerusalem. Jews are afraid to go to East Jerusalem. But there is a lot of interest, and there are many places in this city where you see how mixed it is. The university, the hospitals, the courts, all of these places where you, end, you have to go for some reason to study, to be cured, to be judged, the police. In all of these places, you see basically everybody all together. Uh, so do like Arabs or Muslims move to East Jerusalem now and uh, Jews move to West Jerusalem, uh, East Jerusalem? How is that? Well, uh, again, there's not a clear-cut answer. There's some Jews who live in... Also, by the way, it's not East and West like if you take an orange and you cut it in half. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Um, there are parts that we call just kind of popularly East Jerusalem, like Beit Safafa, that actually is Southern Jerusalem. You know, there's an enclave that was always in Israeli hands in North Jerusalem, the Mount Scopus campus of the Hebrew University. So, as I keep saying to you, everything is not quite what it appears to be. But um, there are some Jews who have moved into um, Muslim areas of East Jerusalem and even of the Old City as an ideological statement, as a way of imposing their presence on Arabs. Um, the, the, the settlers? Yeah, in a way, but they're not living in a West Bank settlement. These are settler, a settler ideology within the confines of the city of Jerusalem. So they are settlers, but they're not settlers in the international imagination sense of those settlers. So like uh, when we were to the old city, um, I remember like people were wearing like uh, guns around, I mean, like rifles and all that. Uh, can anybody wear a gun in Jerusalem? No, not at all. Actually, I don't know who you saw, but if you're just a civilian in Israel, it's very, very, very hard to get a gun, which uh, is a mistake many people make, especially Americans often think, you know, Israel's this macho military culture. But the fact of the matter is that you're, if you're not in a position that requires you to have a gun, uh, gun control laws in Israel are very, very uh, severe. So I don't know who you saw. You may have seen... These are very tense days. You're here during a war, and there have been a lot of um, protests in Jerusalem. You may have seen... Well, I mean, uh, that guy didn't wear a uniform, just like uh, normal clothes. Right. It could have been uh, a West Bank settler. People who live in what are considered dangerous areas have more access to guns. It could have been a plainclothes police officer. I don't know who you saw. I don't know either. Yeah. But um, most of the guns, by far, are in the hands of people who require them for you know, the fulfillment of their professional duty. So like policemen, soldiers? Soldiers, border police, secret service. Are they, are they, are they actually mixed? How, how is that? Like, is, are there Jewish, Arab, Muslim? Well, how does that work? Uh, very, very, very few Arabs serve in the Israeli army. People, some, Bedouins serve in the army. Uh, there's some other populations. I'm not going to go into it right now. It's not a really a Jerusalem question. But in the Jerusalem police, you have a lot of Arabs. Uh, when you see police officers in the old city, uh, there's a very good chance they'll be Arabs. Um, so certainly in the Jerusalem police, it is quite mixed. So like, and in the end, like we, we, I mean, we kind of try to find solutions out of this whole uh, conflict. I mean, it's like we're we're not we're being naive. We we try to dream. We, uh, and I kind of heard like, I mean. Finding a solution, finding peace for this Israeli-Palestine conflict is one thing, but uh, finding a solution for Jerusalem is another? Is that, would you say that? Maybe. I don't know. I'm actually, you know, um, in a way I'm more optimistic for the city of Jerusalem than I am for the political conflict between these two peoples, because I think Jerusalemites have lived together for so long 
since 48. No, okay. since forever. There have always been Jews in Jerusalem. There have always, since, since the beginning of Islam, there have been Muslims in Jerusalem. So it's, we're talking about, you know, over 1,500 years right. of living together. And Jerusalemites are also kind of proud of the way that the city in, contains itself, you know. Um, there have been other times when protests have really violently broken up elsewhere, and you can find old Jerusalemites, Jews, Muslims, Christians, and they'll proudly say, you know, that doesn't happen in our town. It's a more educated population in general, again, among everybody. So while the subject of Jerusalem always comes up in negotiations as this intractable mess, and both Israel and the future state of Palestine claim it as a capital, and it's very difficult to conceive of how eventually that will work. The fact of the matter is that daily life here seems to work, by and large. So, uh, Jerusalem, you said both countries, or uh, future Palestine, they want it as a capital, Israel wants it as a capital? So Israel has it as a capital. The oh, Israeli okay. government is here, the parliament's here, all the ministries are here. It's the Israeli capital, not recognized by most countries internationally, but de facto it's the capital. This is where things happen. For Palestinians, it's a claim. The, the Palestinian government remains in Ramallah. Mm. But uh, yeah, both, both of these states claim Jerusalem as the heart and soul of their current and future states. Do you have, do you have a uh, like a naive solution, or like do you dream of a solution for the, the conflict? Do you think uh, Jerusalem should be like the capital of, of is a binational state or something? I'm not among the people who think that a binational state, one state of two people solution, has a big future. It's very difficult for me to imagine that working. But I do believe in a one city solution. In other words, I can't imagine that Jerusalem will be physically divided the way it was in those 19 years. And I do think uh, there's a real Palestinian claim for Jerusalem. And I think that it's going to be some sort of a unified city in the sense that you can go anywhere in the city, but there's going to have two locuses of government. I mean, that'd be unique, right? I mean, I think it would be unique, yeah. <laughs> We're back to that word. The capital for two countries. Right. I think eventually that's the direction. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, My pleasure. And, oh, and, and you, you didn't tell us what, 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 you actually, what, what you actually do. Oh, I'm a journalist. Oh. <laughs> for, for who? I work for Global Post, an American online publication. So you're a writer? Yes, I am. How's that working out? It's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> Just like the city. Just like the city. That's fair game. I think the world of media today is quite complicated. But you, you're doing fine. I'm doing fine for now. Thank you very much, Noga. Thank you. A pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.